Well, I'd like to tell you today about what is actually a relatively new field and one for which there are relatively limited research results, but it's something that is getting off the ground now and is attracting the attention first of practitioners, but now increasingly the attention of academic institutions, including uh, some at Cornell. And it's the area of conservation finance. Impact investing, you have probably heard a little bit about. You've come across the term in the media. Uh, but I want to just tell you, introduce you to the area of conservation finance, talk a little about impact investing and some related concepts and how they are different from conservation finance, and then go into some of the financial instruments that we can use in order to practice conservation finance and meet the objectives of the field of conservation finance. Uh, finally, I'd like to speak uh, if time allows, and I will try to end at no later than one, so that there's at least 10 minutes, hopefully more, for questions. But I'd also like to tell you a little bit about an initiative in the area of private investment in conservation or conservation finance uh, that is happening now and involves a number of organizations that many of you know or are associated with and that should be interesting. So, what is conservation finance? So, the, several definitions have been thrown out, but one of them is that conservation finance is a mechanism through which a financial investment into an ecosystem is made directly or indirectly through an intermediary that aims to conserve the values of the ecosystem for the long term. And I want to make sure we distinguish be con between conservation finance and simply conservation financing or conservation funding. This is not about raising funds for conservation necessarily, even though that's one of the effects. Conservation finance is a discipline within finance that involves the existence of return-seeking investors, generally banks or other financial intermediaries that fa facilitate that, that uh, sort of delivery of revenue. And um, it, 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 so it's important to distinguish it from the, the, the relatively straightforward raising of funds, not straightforward because it's easy, but conceptually uh, uh, not in area of finance uh, conservation funding is, but a, an actual discipline. Um, an applied discipline, this is another definition by the way, an applied discipline that seeks to leverage the tools of finance to meet conservation needs by facilitating the development of financial products that attract private return seeking capital into conservation. And finally, the way I like to think of it by analogy is with um, conservation biology. In the 1980s, the discipline of conservation biology started its sort of rapid uh, growth. And the whole notion behind conservation biology was to apply conservation knowledge or leverage conservation knowledge for the benefit of biology. By analogy, conservation finance is about leveraging finance knowledge, not conservation knowledge, but uh, 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 finance knowledge in order to uh, facilitate or to uh, support the development of conservation solutions. Um, now, what does it accomplish? Just a few words more about uh, uh, conservation finance. The purpose is to create new long-term diversified sources of revenue supporting biodiversity conservation through the innovative, through the creation or development of innovative investment products providing financial returns and targeting private investments and can involve a number of different actors. And this is one of the key features uh, of conservation finance and the reason why we haven't seen more of it. It requires conservation knowledge and it requires finance knowledge. And as you very well know, finance types and conservation types aren't exactly two groups of people that spend a lot of time interacting and exchanging information and talking to each other, uh, which, uh, about which more later. A few investment ideas in the area of uh, conservation finance. It can cover a number of uh, different sorts of investments, including sustainable timberland. A lot of the early conservation finance transactions 
who are in the area of sustainable timberland. Sustainable fisheries is another promising and interesting area and an area in which the interests of conservation and the interests of finance are closely aligned, more than in almost any other field of conservation finance. If you're talking about sustainable fisheries, good management of fisheries can lead to an improvement in the economic returns of fisheries. So conservation finance as applied to fisheries can deliver economic, better economic returns and can cons uh, deliver conservation returns. Um, other areas in which we see conservation uh, finance transactions developing, sustainable agriculture is one that we're seeing a lot more of. Uh, green infrastructure is one that I don't want to spend a lot of time on, but it is, uh, has been an important area of growth uh, in the last few years. The Nature Conservancy in particular has been spending a lot of time thinking about how are ways in which we can better pr protect coastlines through the use of green infrastructure and, uh, and do so in a way that makes economic sense, that does away with the need to uh, invest large amounts of money in gray infrastructure to produce uh, pardon me, to protect lands close to, uh, to the coastline. Um, with colleagues at, um, I was at the Credit Suisse at the time this work was uh, produced, uh, and in collaboration with colleagues at WWF and McKinsey, we took one initial look at the area of conservation finance. It's a term that has been out there for probably a couple of decades at least. But I was, as I was trying to impress on you at the, be at the beginning, uh, early on people thought of conservation finance as simply as a way to raise money for conservation, as opposed to the way it's looked at now, which is a way of using the tools of finance for conservation involving, a, in other words, a, uh, a relationship between an investor and an investee and uh, generally an intermediary that facilitates the, uh, some kind of financial transaction. We came up with a number of conclusions when we did this work, which we published in 2014 as a self-standing report, but probably the most important um, insights that, that impressed us at least in the process of developing uh, this, this uh, report was number one, the keen interest there appeared to be on the part of high net worth individual investors of investing in conservation products, conservation finance products that would deliver double bottom line returns. And some of you may have heard that term, financial products that deliver economic returns and deliver environmental returns. But the fact is, much of that uh, uh, interest goes unmet because there are very, very few investment products out there that indeed deliver environmental and financial returns. Note that for the purposes of conservation finance, I'm leaving, completely uh, leaving out the discussion of alternative energy, which is a large, multi-billion, mature industry. Uh, in, in and of itself, but which is mostly focused on climate solutions as opposed to specifically conserv habitat conservation uh, activities. Um, so there seemed to be a lot of interest on the part of investors, but not a lot of product for these investors to put their money into. Uh, the second thing that we noticed was the large amounts of capital that would be required to do conservation well. One question that we asked ourselves in the, purpose, in the process of developing this report was, how much money is being spent today on conservation? And the answer that we came up with was roughly $52 billion a year at the time of publication, uh, of which approximately $10 billion a year comes from private, the private sector, I, 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 carbon markets are an example, sustainable commodities are other areas that could, you could refer to or qualify as 
conservation finance transactions, but you know, a pretty modest amount with the balance approximately $42 billion a year being uh, philanthropic donations and governmental appropriations for conservation activities. So $52 billion globally being spent. Then we went into the literature to find answers to the question, how much money should we be spending? if indeed we are spending today 52 billion, and this is a number we came up with. But we found that in the academic literature, there are some estimates for uh, uh, how much we should be spending. And of course, this depends on the assumptions you make and is subject to, to a number of, of uh, uh, caveats. But the numbers that we came up with, that we found, so all stated that between 200 and 500 billion dollars a year is what we should be spending if we're going to maintain a sampling of healthy habitats sustainably managed for the indefinite future, protected areas, etc., or other sustainably managed uh, areas. So we used the consensus estimate of uh, 250 to uh, 350 uh, million a billion dollars a year. Um, so we have our needs, we have our, what we're spending today, and we recognized, wait, even under the most optimistic growth assumptions, say in the five-year horizon, this uh, 42 billion that we're spending today may grow to, say, 40, uh, pardon me, 80 to 100 billion a year in philanthropic and governmental spending on conservation. If our needs amount to three to four hundred billion a year, uh, or thereabouts, that still leaves a huge unmet need. Um, roughly 210 to 290 billion deal, uh, dollars a year. Where is that money going to come from? And given the fact that philanthropies and uh, governments are really maxed out on their conservation spending. Try to get more money out of the big governments of the world, particularly in the United States, for more conservation spending today. Good luck. Um, uh, we just felt for a brief moment they're very frustrated about the likelihood that we were ever going to fill the gap between what is spent or what we estimate will be uh, needed in the five-year horizon and uh, what we will um, be able to count on down here. What do we do with this gap? Very easy to kind of throw in the towel and give up. But then the next sort of insight came when uh, uh, a member, one of the members of this group th said, okay, 210 to 290 billion dollars a year. Sounds like a lot of money. But what does that mean really in terms of the context of the financial system as a whole? And particularly, how much new and reinvested capital is going into the investment markets on a yearly basis? All right? If, uh, if this seems an impossible, or if these seem like impossible goals, um, are they really impossible? Is there enough money out there? And that's when we realize that indeed the gap that needs to be filled it represents only about 1% of all new and reinvested capital in the private investment markets coming from high net worth individuals, coming from uh, uh, pension funds, coming from other private actors that are putting money into the financial system in the form of investments every year. And suddenly, that 1% seemed like, okay, maybe, maybe this isn't a completely unrealistic proposition here. Maybe what we need to be doing is recognizing that there is money out there. There is interest on the part of private investors in putting money into conservation-related investments, investments that will have a positive conservation or environmental benefit. So what is missing in that equation? You have interest, um, the capital is available, what was needed is something that I alluded to before, and that was investable transactions. That's what was missing to help breach that uh, gap between what we spend and what we should be spending. And that got us thinking about um, what the next steps would be. 
And before I tell you about the next steps, what I'd like to touch on briefly, and apologies for the sort of uh, large amount of text this slide was, the particular slide was prepared for uh, sort of reading on a screen, uh, on a laptop screen, or in hard copy. But let me just highlight this. Sustainable finance, for the purpose of, of this discussion, will treat as an umbrella term. And it generally is treated by most people as an umbrella term. Uh, a lot of these terms, as in any new and rapidly growing field, are in flux. Different people use terms in different ways. But generally speaking, when we speak of sustainable finance, we're referring to any form of financial service integrating environmental, social, and or governance ESG criteria into the business or investment decisions for the lasting benefit of cl both clients and society at large. Um, and as has been emphasized by Swiss Sustainable Finance, uh, the terminology used in sustainable finance can be confusing. So don't be surprised ever if you, you uh, come across terms that are used in different ways. Also, the concept of impact investing. I just wanted to uh, clarify how that is different and how it is similar to conservation finance. II, impact investing. The single defining characteristic of impact investing and what makes it different from most other forms of investment is this first one, and that is intentionality. When we speak of invest, impact investing, generally what we're speaking is about an explicit intent on the part of the investor of having a positive environmental or social or both return on the investment in addition to uh, um, economic returns. Uh, impact investing can, is generally divided into social impact investing and environmental impact investing, even though there are certain sorts of investments that seem to sort of bridge this gap. There are a few other uh, elements associated with uh, impact investing, like, just to be clear, these are in, uh, investments with an expectation of return, or at least the full return of the capital. If you invest 100, in an impact investment, and you're expecting that at the end of the year you're going to get back 80, well, really what you're doing is you're giving away 20, right? And that's a charity in respect of those 20. Um, impact investments, uh, in, in any sort of impact investment, there's an expectation of at least return of capital, generally speaking, some modest return economic return on the investment, and in some cases, market-based returns, depending on the investment. Uh, something else is that uh, uh, impact investment, the concept of impact investment can apply to a number of different asset classes, whether it's debt or equity or loans or structured notes and other uh, venture capital and other um, sorts of investments, other asset classes. And finally, there is this element that uh, in theory is there, but often is missing really, realistically, from impact investments, which is the measurement of the impact. It's easy to me measure return on investment from an economic point of view. Either you got a 7% return on your investment or you got 3% or, or whatever it was. That's relatively straightforward. If your intention is to have a positive social or environmental impact, it is sometimes very difficult to actually come up with comparable numbers across investments on environmental and social returns because one investment might be about hectares of forest restored while other investments might be about uh, a, um, a number of people brought out of poverty or amount of low housing, uh, low income housing built or whatever else. Um, great. And uh, just wanted to highlight the fact that when we're speaking of returns, there is generally a spectrum with financial returns on one end of the spectrum and impact only at the other end of the spectrum, with impact only being represented really by philanthropy. All you care is that your money does good and you give it away, or you don't care about the positive impacts that may result from your investment. All you're looking for is risk-adjusted 
maximizing your risk-adjusted returns. And then in between is where a lot of uh, the um, concepts like sustainable finance uh, and impact investing fit in. Mind you, conservation finance is attractive in many cases to return only investors because there are investments in uh, agriculture and sustainable forestry that actually deliver quite handsome returns. Um, and there are a number of challenges facing impact investing from you know, the, the issue of market rate returns or the lack thereof. There are legal disputes associated with putting money into something that may uh, sort of deliver good social or environmental returns, but may actually not deliver the best economic returns. And if you're managing somebody else's money, then you're putting your position at risk and you're actually risking the possibility of a lawsuit if your investor does not want you to be using their money to have positive environmental or social impacts. Which is why impact investing, as much as we hear about it, continues to be and probably will continue to be for the foreseeable future, the realm of the wealthy. Because most uh, people uh, 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 who have funds that they do not manage themselves outsource through their 401ks or through their relationships with their financial advisors, investing to third parties. And those third parties are restricted to putting money into investments that won't maximize returns as a legal matter. Um, so a few sorts of structures that might be of interest. Um, talking about financial structures, I'm talking about the sorts of uh, uh, deals and deal structures that hold promise and that people are starting to deploy in the hopes of developing transactions that will deliver returns for investors and that will have positive environmental uh, impacts in the case of these cases I want to look, like, look at. Um, social impact bonds. This is how uh, uh, the story got started of SIBs and environmental impact bonds, EIBs. Uh, just to get a, uh, some general idea, how many people here have heard about social impact bonds? All right, a smattering of people, um, relatively uh, maybe a half dozen or so. Uh, the basic notion behind a social impact bond and an environmental impact bond is that there are situations in which a modest investment today can lead to a very large savings in the future. There are situations, however, in which that short-term small investment cannot be, even though it makes economic sense to make that investment today in order to save a huge amount of money in the future, cannot happen for any number of reasons, more often than not political. The way social impact bonds got their started was um, they started in England, when people, people started looking at the prison system there and realizing, gosh, the rate of recidivism the rate of people returning to prison shortly after they have been released is exceedingly high. What can we do about this rate of recidivism? And somebody, somebody had the bright idea that, hey, wait a minute, why are prisoners coming back to prison in such high rates? A lot of it has to do with the fact that they are released in, uh, uh, from prison after years behind bars and they don't have job skills that will allow them to find gainful employment. Um, so maybe if we start training people in the sort of shortly before their release from prison with a set of skills that they can deploy in the working world, we will reduce the likelihood that they will end up in, in, in prison again. Um, however, that was exceedingly unpopular as a political matter. Voters didn't like the idea of spending more money still uh, than they were spending already on a per capita basis to keep people behind bars because uh, their logic was we're spending too much money on them already and uh, they need to take care of themselves. 
uh, whereas somebody else said, you're shooting yourself in the foot by putting a small amount of money into training them now, we're actually saving a huge amount of money later when they come back and costs are much higher. So politically unpopular, but, uh, but economically the right thing to do, quite apart from any ethical considerations, okay? We'll leave those for, uh, aside for the moment, even though I think most of us would agree that it makes sense from a social or ethical point of view as well. But, uh, so, so how do we get the money then if it's politically unpopular and there's no way that the local uh, authorities are going to want to invest money in training programs? Let's bring in risk investors who are willing to pay for these job training programs. Once people are released, if the rate of recidivism drops below a certain amount, a certain threshold amount, then investors will be repaid in full. And in fact, they will be pay, repaid uh, handsomely by the local authorities. And it, the local authorities, who are the ones with an interest in reducing the costs associated with imprisonment, were able, as a political matter, because it's, much, it's under the radar, uh, and much less likely to attract attention, enter into these contractual arrangements that allow these at-risk investors to hire service providers to provide training programs. And with the view being, if they don't, uh, if they, if we meet this minimum threshold, we will get, uh, 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 we will be repaid well. And there have been a number of these transactions, mixed success, as you would expect, frankly, in anything this sort of novel and unusual. Uh, but the fact is, uh, more deals are being done, and sort of what the right thresholds are uh, are being adjusted as new deals are being structured. Um, so no need to go into the details of this diagram. I've basically explained the structure. That sort of notion about investing a small amount today to avoid prevent a large cost tomorrow is useful to other in other contexts, like in the environmental context. Some of you may know that the U.S. Forest Service uh, historically spent somewhere between 20 and 20, 10 and 20 percent of its annual budget on, for, on forest fire management, literally putting out fires, literally and figuratively. Um, that has grown to over 50 percent of the Forest Service budget in recent years. For any number of reasons, climate change is likely to be a contributing factor. But the fact is a lot of these forests are overgrown, uh, they are not cleared as often as they should be, our management regimes have interfered with the natural sort of burn cycle that these forests in the western US have been subject to, so these forests are much more crowded, and it was much, much more densely uh, vegetated than they were historically. So what Blue Forest Conservation has done, and this is one of the three partners of Blue Forest Conservation, is a Cornell alum, a CALS alum, uh, who started this work uh, right after, in fact, during um, his MBA program uh, at Berkeley. Uh, and um, the idea being, if we go to the Forest Service and say, we will invest upfront capital to better manage forests, which will have a conservation benefit because it will, the forest will look more like the forest of pre-industrial times. And in addition, in managing the forest in that way, the one of the results is going to be that it's going to reduce the amount of forest fires because basically what we're doing is thinning forests so that they look more like what these forests have always looked at for thousands of years. Um, you government uh, forest service pay us uh, we'll save you a lot of money in managing forest fires and uh, a, a, and uh, we'll have uh, what is biologically ec ecologically a healthier forest seem to be a no a win win in addition um, the utilities had a water utilities in california and as you all know no doubt uh, water is a, is, is a huge issue in California, particularly in the Central Valley and in the south of California, uh, a highly contentious issue. 
uh, and utilities have, uh, it, it is in their interest to best manage resources. Well, forest fires don't go very well with good water management. The hot temperatures tend to burn the surface, make it less permeable, water runs off rather than sinking into the subsoil and ends up uh, in the nearby rivers and isn't necessarily uh, kept in that gigantic sponge, which is the forest. Um, so utilities are also interested in a better management of those forests. Through a, and I, again, not wanting to go into too much detail here, through clever management of uh, the flows of funds and looking to align the interests of investors and of the Forest Service and of the utilities, this structure looks to bring in all of the parties working together in such a way that the right economic uh, result happens, a, re a reduction of uh, expenditures on forest fires and forest fire management. There is a we have healthier soils, we have better biodiversity and healthier forests. Uh, and this forest, so-called forest resilience bond has not closed yet, but uh, they've been working on it for a couple of years with substantial support from uh, a foundation such as the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and uh, this is just a little bit a description of the capital stack. There is, you know, as you might expect with many sophisticated transactions, the senior debt, the mezzanine debt, and some sort of residual equity uh, element. Uh, and let's skip through that quickly to mention this other example briefly, which is about water in D.C. Uh, and the fact that D.C. has a real problem because they have an issue called combined sewage overflow, as many cities in, in this country do, in which too much water in the event of strong rains goes into the nearby bodies of water, rivers, untreated because the existing treatment plants uh, don't, don't have the capacity to deal with this uh, surge that, that happens only very so often uh, in, in, uh, uh, as a result of a storm. The, inf the gray infrastructure solution to this is to build gigantic underwater reservoirs for, for uh, sewage overflow and make sure that you can treat it before it is released to the nearby rivers. That's one solution. The other solution, more inexpensive solution, has been to find alternatives to sort of those massive infrastructure projects. A real obvious being, uh, one being, there are lots, there's lots of paved services in Washington. It makes sense from an economic point of view, rather than spend billions of dollars in creating an underground reservoir that you use one or two or five times a year, maybe, to pay people to dig up parking lots. Indeed, those who are able to dig up parking lots may actually have an incentive, uh, if they can do so at low cost, to sell credits for uh, 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 relating to the system to others who, for whatever reason, cannot dig up parking lots or other impermeable surfaces uh, due to the economics of, of the situation. And a trading system has, has uh, uh, developed uh, between actors in, in the D.C. area. And D.C. water is famously progressive with sort of innovative uses of finance in finding uh, solutions to their own needs as well as uh, solutions that provide environmental benefits. Uh, and this is a quick uh, description of how the system works. I think we've covered essentially all of these points uh, orally. And uh, this is just a repayment uh, schedule. Uh, this is a third kind of transaction that actually won the uh, Environmental Finance Deal of the Year 2015 from Environmental Finance Magazine. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail. It's a transaction that uh, I was directly involved in, but in the interest of time, I'll skip over it. But let me just uh, summarize what I've said up until now by saying that what I'm trying to illustrate here with these examples is that there are ways in which financial engineering, finance, 
Again, distinguishing finance as a discipline from financing or fundraising for conservation. But finance is a discipline, and the use of novel financial instruments can help us achieve environmental and social needs if applied correctly, if we're actually able to devote the resources and the brain power to coming up with transactions like the ones that I have uh, presented in these examples. Um, so if, uh, and I'll use the last couple of minutes to tell you about an initiative that uh, was launched two years ago at the World Conservation Congress of the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is sort of the, the UN of the environmental world. The initiative is called the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation. And the idea behind it was if there is willing capital to go into this space um, and there's a need, why aren't more transactions happening? Uh, we know that that appears at least to be the, the stumbling block. Okay, let's do something about the stumbling block. Let us bring together the people who know about environment and the people who know about finance with a smattering of lawyers and academics to really work together across disciplines to develop these double bottom line transactions that provide not just financial returns, banks are, bankers are very good at that, uh, and not just environmental benefits, which the environmental community is good at, but they don't necessarily think uh, uh, as finance people. So it is this cross-pollination, we argued, that is missing and that we have to facilitate. So this uh, initiative was launched with the aim of uh, creating models or blueprints for the successful delivery of investable transactions. The four founders were Cornell Credit Suisse, IUCN, and the Nature Conservancy working with a smattering of organizations as partners, some of which you will know well, like WWF, a couple of other universities, including Yale and uh, Oxford. And um, this is just a little bit more detail about what an investment blueprint is, but it is, the term is really self-descriptive. There are three phases to this work, the development of, uh, of uh, blueprints, then the next phase is the structuring of the actual transactions. Based on these schematic blueprints, we can produce ter so-called term sheets, which are tailored to individual transactions and have the names of investors and the expected returns and the parties. And this is much more sort of grounded in a specific system. And then ultimately, um, Phase three is the actual execution of the transaction. Rockefeller Foundation have committed up until now $2 million for this work, and the Jeff, the Global Environment Facility, $8 million. And I'm pleased to say that just very recently, the Atkinson Center has agreed to fill in uh, uh, some of this sort of missing blueprint development work, which is the lowest cost, I should say, of all of these phases, but is an important one to facilitate the later work. Uh, there are five working groups in the uh, steering committee uh, focused on different sorts of systems, coastal resilience, forests, uh, water, ag, and coastal fisheries. And the idea is to develop these blueprints, later term sheets, later actual closed, executed, funded transactions that will achieve the aim of providing investors with investable opportunities that have these double or triple bottom lines, environmental benefits and economics. Uh, and I should leave it right there.